Hello and welcome to Skype A Scientist Live. My name is Noah Guyberson and I am so excited that you are all here to learn about ocean microplastics from our very special guest, marine biologist, Sandra Schleier, who's gonna to talk to us about how these very small plastics can cause very big problems. Before I hand over to Sandra, I'd like to first mention that Skype A Scientist is a nonprofit organization that aims to bring science to as many people as possible, as much as humanly possible. So if you'd like to support our program, you can do so at patreon.com slash Skype A Scientist or at paypal.me slash Skype A Scientist. If you have any questions for Sandra, please put them in the Q&A section below. And with that, Sandra, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and your work? I'm nice to be very excited to speak to all of you. And um, just before we start, I want to give a huge thanks to Skype Scientists. This organization is very dear to my heart. Uh, you know, I first started with you guys just wanting to be a scientist to help out in the classrooms. And I love the project. And I've loved all the classrooms that I've been a part of. And all those teachers were always giving me a warm welcome. So this project is amazing. I truly believe in it. And I'm so excited to be here with everyone today. So um, I am from Puerto Rico. I did my bachelor's degree at the University of Puerto Rico, and then I did my master's at the University of Rhode Island. I currently have a couple of jobs as a scientist. Um, you know, you don't always go into research, and but if you have a love for the ocean, there are different jobs where you um, can excel as a scientist. And I, um, so I am a co programs coordinator for a nonprofit called Scuba Dog Society. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about my work with them. And I'm also gonna, you know, give a brief intro on what microplastics are and how they get into the ocean. So I'm just gonna quickly share my screen. Okay, everyone's seeing this. And let me do the present. go okay how's that looks great okay awesome all right guys so um so i want to just talk to you guys a little bit about microplastics so you know tiny plastics a huge problem and i'm also going to mention um, how corals are affected by microplastic pollution so as i was doing my master's at the university of rhode island um, my case study was I studied um, corals and their decline, and I also looked at how restoration projects were in the Caribbean were, you know, giving corals a second chance. So um, I'm going to start talking about the plastic pollution. So everyone, plastic pollution is a huge problem. Um, it is something that how, you know, plastic was created um, you know, to just make us more comfortable. It's also because it's a very durable um, material. It's, the problem is that it's so good that it's not biodegradable. And up to date, eight, eight, so 8,300 million metric tons of plastic has been produced. And that's up to date. So it's a little bit more. This was, this was actually up to 2015. So now it's a little bit more. And and it, just let's think about this number, you know, 8,300 8, million metric tons. This is so much plastic that has been created. And out of that, 4,600 million metric tons are in our landfills or in our natural environment. And that is a huge number. So in our landfills, they're there, but they're not going to biodegrade. So they're just going to be there for you know years to come with no solution because they will never biodegrade. Out of those, only 600 million, you know, 600 million metric tons are recycled, and only 80, um, 800 million are incinerated. So we still see this huge gap of how much we have in our natural environment. And that is a huge problem, especially for the ocean. Why? Because anything that we throw on land, um, near rivers, um, just on, in any land in general, everything goes back to the ocean. It's runoff, um, the river's carrying it. 
it all ends up in the ocean. So every year there's, it's an estimated of 8 million metric tons of plastic that enter our ocean. And to date, we think that there's about 150 million metric tons that are just in our marine environment. And it's, it's one of those numbers that I'm, you know, when I looked at the numbers, I'm like, oh my God, that is so much plastic in the ocean. And we can see it. We can see it when, you know, if we're snorkeling, we can see it on the beach. We can see it um, whenever, you know, we are swimming and something bumps into us and look, it's a water bottle. The Great Pacific Patch alone holds about 1.8 trillion plastic. So this is a huge problem. It's an, it's an even bigger problem because it starts getting into the marine ecosystems and it starts getting eaten by our most charismatic creatures such as whales and turtles. So whales are filter feeders, they swim, they're swimming along the water column and they have their mouth open because they're looking in for krill, looking in for other um, zooplankton. However, they cannot filter out all the plastic that's in the water column and it's just going into their mouth. So, you know, they get plastic bags, they get straws, cutlery, um, plastic bottles. And this is a huge problem for whales and other marine creatures such as um, coastal birds because once they ingest enough plastic, their body makes them feel full. So they feel, they feel full and they eventually starve because they're not getting that nutrient intake that they need. Also, it's a huge problem because plastic can also be a vector for diseases or contaminants. So our whales are endangered thanks to all this plastic pollution, our turtles, our seabirds, and we have found um, we have found these organisms beached or dead on, on the beach. And when you open them up, you can see the amount of plastic that's in their stomach. So this is real. We are seeing this currently. An even bigger problem, so, is these tiny pieces of plastic. So over time, um, so microplastics are any pieces of, of you know, plastic particles or fragments, that are less than five millimeters in size. And, you know, it can be from, you know, direct manufacturing. So for example, microbeads that come in beauty products. It wasn't until 2015 that Obama let, um, you know, in the US, Obama had a law passed um, that we would do, you know, we would have, you know, microbeads free oceans. So they, so it banned it from the beauty products, but that wasn't until, five years ago. So there's a lot of microbeads in the ocean environment because we use it on the beauty products and, and then so they go down the drain and that eventually ends up in the ocean. Because these little pieces of plastic go through the water treatment plants, they're not filtered out there because they're so small. You know, we, we are getting it in our water, we're getting it in our oceans and it's a huge problem. So they're very tiny, but it's a huge problem. We also get microplastic from wave action, UV ra uh, radiation and abrasion um, to other bigger pieces. So, you know, these smaller pieces that just break off, but we also get it from fibers from our clothing. So there's numerous, air, numerous ways that we get microplastics and they are going into our marine ecosystems. They are going into our own, um, you know, so to our own bodies. Because eventually, if, if a fish eats zooplankton and eats some of the microplastic, at some point we're gonna eat the fish. And that means that the microplastics get in our system. And I'm not gonna talk too much about this, but um, recent studies have found that, you know, we are ingesting, um, we are ingesting microplastics from our food. To date, there is an estimated 15 to 51 trillion microplastics particles in the oceans. And that's what we can estimate. We don't know how much more there really is. So I'm gonna mention quickly um, how are corals affected from this? So corals are my, or you know, my favorite animal. I studied them during my masters and 
I was part of citizen science projects where we did a lot of coral restoration. And so microplastics affect corals because corals, even though they have a symbiotic relationship with zooplankton, um, you know, with, with this with zooxanthellae, sometimes they do turn to eating, you know, to eating um, whatever particles, you know, food particles that are in the water column. So sometimes they accidentally ingest plastic. So they accidentally ingest plastic, and this impacts their physiology, their growth, um, their health. Um, sometimes we can we can even see how microplastics um, go into the coral, not because the polyp ate it, but, all, but just because we were finding it embedded in the sides because there's a lot of in the water and it um, settles on the coral. So coral reef systems are very important to us because they bring in, the, they bring food, um, you know, they're a source of income in tourism. And these, these, this is an ecosystem that we have to protect, that we are currently fighting to protect. There's a lot of different projects doing coral restoration because we need to save our reefs. So our reefs are already under a lot of pressure because of um, temperature rise. And this is a new stressor that in the last couple of years, scientists have been studying. So we have found that not all corals respond to microplastics the same way, but when they do, if they accidentally ingest it, sometimes they return it back, but that causes them energy. And it's energy they cannot, um, they cannot lose. Okay, so that it's energy that they cannot waste because they're already under enough stress. Stress not to bleach because of temperature rise, um, sediments. So there's a lot of different stressors that coral reefs are um, fighting off. And now they have a new one, which is microplastics. You guys want to learn a little bit more about microplastics and you know the negative implications on on coral reef health. Um, so I am the founder and co um, co editor in chief of Reef Bites. So Reef Bites is this um, really cool blog that we started. Um, so grad students started. So we can bring more um, coral reef related research to the general public without that scientific jargon. So we basically just want to tell you the story of what scientists are finding out in their research, but in a more digestible way. So um, you guys want to know more about corals, we're always posting every week. So it's reefbites.com. So now I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about what I do. So how do I come into the microplastics world? Um, as I mentioned before, I am a coordinator for the nonprofit Scuba Dog Society in Puerto Rico. And my, so my, my work is to um, manage volunteers, um, carry out different citizen science projects. And within those, um, we have one where we monitor microplastics. So microplastics is a huge problem, and it's not something only scientists um, have to deal with, but it's the whole world. So we decided to create this project where we use basic scientific techniques to find out um, presence of microplastics on the beaches and in the water. So we gathered up volunteers. Um, we taught them how to do the sampling. So here are some of my volunteers taking in water samples, taking in um, sand samples. Okay, so they, they go out to their designated beach, they collect the samples, and then we come to the lab, and in the lab they process their samples. So we have um, we took we have a density separator, which so the way it works is that um, we throw the sand samples in that tube on the left. So if you guys are looking at that, um, one of my volunteers on the left, there's a huge PVC tube. Um, and that inside that, that PVC tube, water it fills up. So you, you put in the sand sample inside and as water fills up, microplastics um, don't weigh a lot. So they stay in the water column as the sand sinks to the bottom. So as water um, keeps, you know, goes through the tube, it's going to um, take the microplastics with it. And then we have 
So it's really tiny and maybe you guys can't see it, but there's like a little filter on um, the opening on the tube. So when the water passes through the filter, all the microplastics stay there. So this is a methodology. This is a scientific methodology that we're using. Um, some grad students were using in the University of Louisiana. And so they you know, taught us how to do it. We modified it a little bit so it could become a citizen science project. And so these are you know, community members. These are volunteers. Um, not all of them have a science background. Some of them are mothers who you know, join the project so their kids can learn about microplastics. And it's an awesome way to show the community and so they can know what, you know, what are microplastics and how are they affecting us and why should we care? So after um, the sand is um, after the sand is processed, um, that last product is a water sample, which also then is filtered. And then those filters with the microplastics are looked under the microscope to identify what kind of microplastics are we finding? Are we finding any microplastics? And so far, um, these are some of the results that my volunteers have presented. We had a symposium in 2019, um, and we've kept the project running this year as well. It's been a it's been a, it's been a little on hold because of COVID, but we're soon going to have a second symposium. And so this is some of the results that they found. You know, they found fibers, fragments, filaments, microbeads, all this in our water, um, in, in our ocean water, and sand. Um, beach sand samples. We also found that so so this is a little bit of how much we are finding of each. So microfab so microfabrics um, was the most that we found at uh, thirty eight percent. Microfab uh, microfabrics micro sorry microfibers <laughs> microfibers. Um, so they're coming from our t shirts. They're coming from cloths. So anything that we're using in terms of clothing, clothing, that's where most of the microfibers come from. Okay. So with this, this is a little bit about me and what I do. And I hope to, you know, get cool questions, guys, because I'm excited to talk to everyone. Well, there certainly are lots of questions. It was a great presentation. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> um, I will get started um, relaying right. some of this to you, but just in case anyone has any more questions, just a reminder, you can put them in the little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, uh, and I'll try to get to all of them. So um, the first question I saw was people are interested uh, in whether or not for this type of work you ever do scuba diving. Um, so, for, so for this type of work in terms of uh, the microplastics, I haven't, do, I haven't done any scuba diving. However, uh, for my master's, so during my master's, I looked at different restoration projects and how restoring some species of coral affect the whole reef community. For that, I did about 47 dives. <laughs> so yes, um, it helps to be a diver. And as a marine biologist, you definitely can do research where diving is involved. You go through a special training. Um, so it's from the AAUS, which is the American Association for Underwater, so um, American Academy for Underwater Sciences. And, you know, it's a certification that you get. So, um, you know, you know, you, that's where you learn different methodology also. So you, you're using diving as a tool for research. <laughs> Great. Um, here's another question um, that maybe uh, we can broaden a little bit. So the question is basically, what is the most polluted ocean? Um, do you have any <laughs> thoughts about that? Um, well, so the biggest garbage patch is in the Pacific Ocean. Um, I don't remember the last time I looked. It was a couple miles in diameter. So I don't know the exact name. But so I did reference the Great Garbage Patch because um, that is where a lot of the microplastics as well are there. So um, the Pacific, I, I think, yeah, I definitely would say the Pacific. Also, there's a lot of different islands. Um, so in the Pacific where, you know, plastic was new to them in the last couple of years. And I would say, well, I guess now I would say in the last like 10 years, you know, um, so products such as water, you know, water in bottles and soda in bottles. So, 
you know, that's pretty new to them. So they don't really have, they didn't really have a waste management protocol. So a lot of these, um, you know, waste is just there on the island. Um, also, a lot of these islands get a lot of garbage coming in from the currents. So I would say the Pacific. I have to, I, I, I don't want to, don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, but as you know, within what I've read and what I've studied, I'd say that that is, I think, one of the most polluted oceans. But everything's connected. So <laughs> can come back to the Atlantic or the Indian. So we have another great question here about um, what are some different ways that corals process plastic and what do the plastics do to the corals? So the coral, um, so the coral doesn't get any nutrition from the plastic. So when, so there's a couple of things that happen. Um, some so, and it depends on the different species of coral. So some some species of corals have been seen to ingest plastic, and then 48 hours later they're ingesting it back. So they're just vomiting essentially. Um, and that is an impact on itself because the coral wastes a lot of energy doing that. You know, just, you know, it's just pushing back their meal is energy wasted. Um, other things that corals, some corals have been seen to do is that they will ingest it accidentally and they will keep it. So what that does is that it decreases um, that they want to keep eating. So it's a little bit like what happens with um the whales and the turtles is that they feel full so it's not completely it's not the same because they're different animals but we have so it has been seen that microplastics that has you know that was ingested um cause decreases in growth in coral health um inefficiency in eating cool so we have another question here uh about um, the scuba dog society, and it's a quick one, just how many people are in the scuba dog society? And also um, they wanna hear how you can, they can volunteer for this project. Um, okay, so we are open to all volunteers. Um, so we are a huge organization, very small staff. <laughs> so when I say huge, it's because whenever we do any activities, all the volunteers, um, come in and so we you know they're part of our family but in terms of the staff we're seven <laughs> we're a very small staff but we do very big things and our activities and events are open to anyone we're also open to collaboration with anybody that's you know not here in Puerto Rico and is there a particular place they can look to find information about how to volunteer yes so website? um no, of course, you can visit our website and you can also visit our social media. So if you look up Scuba Dog Society, um, you remember Scuba Dog Society, <laughs> you need the society part because there is a dive shop called Scuba Dogs. Um, you'll find our logo, which is the little um, puppy paw in green and blue. So that's us. So yeah, no, just follow us on social media and we're always open to collaborations <laughs> um, and bond. Great. So there's no, no, it's fine. Um, I got a question here about, well, I'm not sure if you, you may not know the answer to this, but whether uh, marine zoology is a good career option in India. And I will, because that may be out of, out of your career, uh, sort of marine biology career counseling knowledge, but um, I, w I wonder if maybe you know about anything about really interesting marine ecosystems near India that might be worth studying if you're over there. So I've never been to India. It is definitely on the bucket list. Um, what I would say, and this is, I think this is more, you know, this is advice to anyone. So marine biology um, or marine zoology, anything having to relate to the ocean, if it's something that you really love, um, I say go for it. Study it because you, you will find a job where you will use that knowledge. Um, so a lot of people think that science are just for scientists and science is also for anyone who wants to, you know, teach the world about science. So I've been a science teacher, um, a programs coordinator. Um, currently, I'm also a tour guide and I do trips to the bioluminescent base of Puerto Rico. I, that's my night job. And 
this is one of the ways where I, you know, teach science to the world. So I tell people about bioluminescence, about the marine ecosystems that surround it. So if it's something that you love, go for it. If you're looking for, um, you know, where is the best place to study it, do a little bit of research. Um, a lot of the things that I know is because I Google. I Google. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 10th grade, I remember Googling just to see if I could find any sort of activity close to home or anywhere where I can go and just learn about it. And that's how I got my first uh, marine biology experience. I went to Alabama when I was in 10th grade. My parents were like, oh my God, is she leaving for Alabama for a month? She's only 15. <laughs> but yes, um, power, power of the internet. There's a lot of and if you guys need any help, just, you know, contact me, slyer.sandra at gmail.com. Great. Um, so this is a question, I, at some point you showed some like, I guess microscopy of the different like shapes you can find in microplastics. And this question is about, um, do the shape of microplastics change through the years or stay the same? And how, like maybe with different materials that are being used in plastics and how might that differently affect the microorganisms or organisms that, that take up that plastic? Well, definitely. So that is um, essentially that's what microplastic, and that's what ends up happening with microplastics. So um, some of them, yes, start out as microplastics, like microbeads and fibers from your clothing, but some of it is just pieces of plastic from even bigger pieces. And how you know throughout the years, so a big piece of plastic throughout the years can receive UV light. Um, abrasion, so and wave action, so maybe they're getting hit constantly, you know, in the at the beach, they're getting constantly hit, you know, from the waves to the to the rocks, so they break down, and yes, they take in different shapes. Um, the smaller they are, the easier it is for organisms to ingest them. Um, but even coastal birds, coastal birds have been found to have weird shapes of plastics inside. So I'm saying, let's um, take maybe like a water bottle and over the years it broke and it, there's just like that small little piece and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll pick it up. And turtles, for example, they're eating plastic bags because they think they're jellyfish. So it's, the problem is that the shapes of these, of these plastics often resemble the food of these organisms that ingest them. That's a good point. Um, so here's a question about, uh, what can people do to reduce our input of microplastics and microfibers to waterways? Uh, and the second question in this is, uh, are, are basically fiber catchers in laundry useful? And then a third question in this one, uh, are water treatment facility, can water treatment facilities attempt to design and implement smaller filters? So basically all just what, what can be done and what is being done at the personal and industrial scale to prevent this from getting out. Okay. So in the personal scale, um, we need to reduce our use of plastic. That's it. We need to, there are certain things that we can substitute. Um, you know, don't use plastic bags, use reusable bags. Do not buy water bottles, plastic water bottles. Use your, sorry, use your own and refill it every time. Um, sometimes when you get takeout, ask them not to give you any cutlery, any plastic cutlery, because you're going home, so you don't really need it or um, carry a fork with you. So I actually carry <laughs> in my purse, I carry a mini fork and um, you know, little knife and little spoon. And I also carry my metal um, straw. So I do like straws with my drink, who doesn't? You know, if I'm drinking a, mo a mojito, I want a straw. So, you know, I take, I have a metallic one with me. Um, so there are definitely ways, you know, we as a person, uh, you know, as a person, we just need to reduce our use of plastic. And we also need to talk to the government and ask, ask them to be more, um, they need to be harder on all these companies that produce plastic. And us as consumers, we also need to ask the companies, you know, we don't want plastic packaging. You know, we don't want unnecessary plastic <laughs> in our, in, you know, in what we buy. And this is hugely important because we're the consumer. So if we don't ask the companies what we want, they're never going to change because for them, it's easier, it's cheaper to continue producing plastic. 
Um, on an industrial scale, that's also, we as individuals, we also need to um, try and find the word. I have it in Spanish in my head, but. Um, I mean, I'd love to hear that. <laughs> we need to demand, that's the word. So we need to demand that, um, you know, that things be done. So uh, water, so water treatment plants can definitely find a, you know, a better way to filter out the water. They can be, they can do smaller filters. Um, we just have to demand it. We just have to, you know, say, hey, this is a huge problem. This is the research. People are ingesting plastic. So, <laughs> um, I guess, yeah, we as an individual need to fight back on this. This is something that just affects all of us. And if you, if you are unsure on how to start, there are so many different people already fighting the same. So you can just join a cause. Thank you. Okay, great. So this is uh, another, I can combine, we've got loads and loads of questions. So I'm gonna try to start bundling them uh, if they're similar. So here, here's two bundled together. And the first one is, uh, how did you know you wanted to do this type of work? And the second <laughs> one is, how long did it take to learn about the microplastics and its effects, uh, microplastics and its effect on oceans? So uh, that I assume that is like, how long did it take you in your education about microplastics to sort of master this field? Um, alternatively, it may also be a question about when in history people in general started worrying about microplastics. Feel free to take it any way you want. <laughs> All right. Um, so first thing, as a marine biologist, my, um, so I think I've studied seven years. So I did five years for a bachelor's degree. Um, I took a year to study abroad, so <laughs> and I think you should definitely do it if you have the chance. Um, so yeah, so five years of my bachelor's degree, two years on my master's, um, but I didn't study anything that had to do with microplastic. Microplastic came after, so when I got my job as the programs coordinator, the way I got the job was before, um, so before the job, they actually had started the project. They, had, they were looking for captains or leaders who wanted to do the beach sampling and the processing on a certain beach. So I, um, you know, I joined them as a captain. So I would go to my, to my beach every month. I would do my sampling. I would do my processing. And in the meantime, I learned a lot about microplastics. I you know, started to read about microplastics. There's really cool research being done. And then after that, that's how, you know, because I was part of that program and they had the opening for programs coordinator, I applied, I got it. So now I'm managing the project. But that's actually how I started from the way down. And I started learning just by reading all the information that's out there, reading scientific literature, um, reading, you know, sometimes scientific literature, it is a, a little hard to read. But there are people and there are, are websites who want this information to go out to the general public so they digest it, they make it better. If you actually Google how much plastic goes into our ocean, you're going to find the answer and it just quickly tells you. Um, I think I was going to, uh, what was the other part? I know there was another part to this question. I just. It, well, it was about sort of like how how long it took you to sort of get to where you are in your career, which I think you've broadly answered. Um, yeah. And then maybe, I, I can't tell if this, this may be the question also, I can't tell uh, whether it was just sort of like when in history humans began to oh, yes. realize the problem. I, I'm, yeah. it's, I'm, I'm <laughs> unclear on the exact meaning of the question. It's one of those. It's okay, I had that. Um, so people just, people just started um, worrying about microplastics in the last eight to 10 years or at least that's how long the you know information has been sh shared with the public. As in terms of like plastic pollution in general, um, plastic pollution started heavily after you know 1950s. So that is when you know we started demanding more products that were plastic because it's cheaper to make. Um, it brings a lot of commodities, um, especially single use. You know, a lot of the plastic that we produce is only in our hands for a couple of minutes and then it's thrown away. Okay, and well, that leads right into the next question, which a lot of people had this question. So this is great. I can put a lot of these questions together. And generally <laughs> awesome. what they're wondering about is sort of how, what, what can we do, not just to reduce our use, but to actively clean up microplastic that's in the ocean. Um, what are some things that are being done on that particular front? Uh, and so what are some challenges to that? 
Um, particularly, I'm seeing a lot of interest in the way currents um, move microplastics around the world and how might that uh, create challenges in different places that are affected by different currents. It is really hard. Um, I've read a, I've read a lot of the subjects where it's very hard to clean up microplastics. It's easier to clean up bigger pieces of plastic because you kind of can see if you're taking other organisms with them. But microplastics are found, you know, more commonly in the water column. So, you know, some people would say, oh, why don't we just, you know, take a huge net or, you know, you know, a huge net with the, you know, less than five millimeters so we can actually capture them and drag it. But then you would be taking so many, you know, organisms that are important to the ecosystem. So that's not really a solution. Um, people have, there are scientists who are looking at different bacteria that eat plastic. So there's, a, there's some research being done on, being done on that. Um, another thing that, you know, as individuals, something we can do is that we can advocate, you know, get together as a group and advocate that something needs to be done, that more money needs to be re redirected to looking into solutions. Um, there have been many different, um, I don't want to say startups, but I have seen different small projects on how to clean plastic. And you hear about it, but you don't hear about big companies investing in that, or you don't hear about the government saying, oh, hey, that's a good idea. Let's do that. So it's, we, we have to advocate as a population um, in, around the world, you know, you know, we need to advocate in our government saying like, hey, we need to invest in research that's looking for these solutions. Uh, and another aspect of that question, which I see people are quite interested in is um, the effect to which microplastics um, are impacting different bodies of water, like not only different, you know, oceans, but also like in the lakes and rivers and the other ecosystems that are uh, marine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, so the way that they impact is not only just to, you know, organisms, because, you know, we, we know a lot about whales and turtles because when they die, we see them and we can, you know, do a necropsy and see the contents of their stomach. But the truth is that it's, any, it's a, lot of, a lot of different organisms, um, especially plankton. So plankton also ingests microplastics. Plankton, um, you know, um, contrary to, pop to popular belief, it's not the trees where we get most of our oxygen, it's the plankton, you know, the phytoplankton. That's, you know, they create most of our oxygen and a lot of the zooplankton eat microplastics. And so we, we know we're getting plankton that's eating microplastics and that's, and that's how it goes into, how, how it starts going into our food chain. And then the fish eat it, bigger fish eat it, we end up eating it. Um, also, microplastics and plastics in general are a good vector to, um, for diseases and contaminants. So the way that this polymer is built, it absorbs contaminants. So any contaminants in the water will be absorbed by them. And if that plastic that absorbed contaminants or absorbed any or you know has any disease on it and is eaten by um, by an animal and then eaten by a person, so we're ha we're just getting more contaminants filled in, um, you know, for us or in, um, for different organisms. So this is how plastic affects any 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 water system, you know, any waterway, even like on land because they do absorb contaminants and they do absorb, um, we're not absorbed, but you know, bacteria settles on it. So they are a vector for disease. Well, just jumping right off bacteria, since you mentioned um, something before as well about bacteria that like eat plastic. Um, there's a great question here, which is how do you feel about the idea of releasing a lab created organism into the ocean that eats plastic, such as the microplastic eating bacteria from the 2016 Idianella sakaiensis developed by Japanese students. What are some benefits and drawbacks of that? No, of course. Uh, that's why I said they're in the research stages, right? So they are trying to find out um, first, are there bacteria that can eat plastic? Second, when they eat it, 
you know, what's the byproduct? And third, that's a huge question. Um, what happens to the bacteria when there's no more microplastic? You know, is it going to die off? Is it going to start eating something else? Um, so that that's still in the research stages, and I'm not I'm not one of the scientists who's working on that. I just I have read on it. Um, how do I feel about releasing a bacteria that eats plastic? I don't know. Um, I think that it needs to be thoroughly researched before releasing. Um, we have a bad history of releasing, you know, organisms to use as biocontrols, and then that biocontrol becomes an invasive species, displacing all the natural fauna or, or endemic species. So I don't know. We need a lot more research, but also. Microplastic is very hard to get rid of in the natural environment. So it might be a solution. <laughs> so maybe a, a, another um, spin off of that question. Rob Frawley asks, are there labs studying microplastic ingestion in species in culture, maybe like in a laboratory setting to look at the changes in their biology in, in response to in, imbibing plastic? So, in, um, so I know that they've been doing it on coral. Um, so if you look up some research on microplastic effects on corals or corals ingesting corals, sorry, uh, corals ingesting microplastics, you'll find that there is a couple of labs who are researching, you know, different species of corals. They're a little bit easier to have in a tank, you know, in the lab. And um, the one of the studies that I was reading just before I hopped on uh, here today was how they're worried that when, so whenever the temperatures are hot, you know, get hotter, um, corals get so stressed out that they bleach, they push out their symbiont. So they bleach, when they bleach, they're not getting their carbon input from um, the sosynthelic from their symbionts. So then they turn to heterotrophy, which means that they, you know, they can't make their own food, so they need to actively, um, so there was a study being done on how the scientist was looking at feeding, um, you know, food particles to this coral, but also feeding it plastic to see how, you know, how it would react if it would ingest the plastic or not. There, so plastic was ingested, but in these particular species, they weren't um, necessarily wanting to ingest the plastic. They was, you know, ingested. It was ingested um, accidentally. So I can talk about corals because those are some of the ones that I've seen the most. Plus they're easier to, you know, in a, an environmental set, in an experimental setting in the lab, it's a little bit easier. I don't think they've done this on whales or, <laughs> or turtles because it's, it's a huge organism and it's a huge loss. Um, so yes, I hope that answers your question. So there are controlled experiments where they're feeding microplastics. I know that they're doing it with different species of corals to see how they're going to react to, you know, this input of microplastics in the ocean. Great. Uh, I, I'm also seeing a lot of questions asking sort of generally about, um, you know, science communication on this issue. Um, uh, <laughs> certainly a lot about how specifically important it is um, to communicate about plastic pollution and its effects on coral reefs and ecosystems. So. Um, you certainly touched on a lot of these topics, but I'm, I'm just wondering if maybe they would be interested in hearing about your efforts in general to sci do science communication, on, science communication on this topic and why you think that's important, et cetera. Definitely. Um, actually, I love this question um, because when I, when I first started, you know, as a, as, a, as a child wanting to study marine biology, I always thought that I was going to be this, you know, researcher on, on, in a boat or research or, you know, going diving. Um, so I just imagined myself being this biologist that was just in the field all the time. And, you know, as my education progressed and my experiences, I realized that I do like research, but I love communicating the results even more. So I'm a big fan of science communication. I want to say that that is like some of what my career, um, you know, is doing. So as a scientist, I've opted more for, you know, taking positions as a scientist where I can communicate results, where I can pass on my knowledge. 
So I'm all for science communication. And as a, as a grad student, I joined the International Coral Reef Society. Um, we didn't have a student chapter. So me and another student, we created the student chapter. And during that, you know, getting members and starting to getting involved, I decided, hey, I once wrote for a blog on ocean related topics. And this, so this blog is called Ocean Bites. It's huge. You guys should Google it. I love that blog. And it, you know, it inspired me to um, create Reef Bites. So Reef Bites is, you know, our way of doing science communication where we have students that are practicing their writing, but they're practicing, um, you know, not just scientific, it's not scientific writing what they're practicing. They're practicing how to take scientific writing and turn it into a story for the general public. And all of my writers are really great. Uh, they're learning every day even more. Some of them are great storytellers. So just, you know, just taking in all this research and making it more digestible for the general public is, is great. So science, science communication is an amazing tool. It is very much needed because the world is everyone's and our problems are everyone's. And a lot of people don't know a lot and don't care a lot about, about the marine ecosystems, but not because they just don't care, it's because they don't understand. They don't understand what's happening. They don't understand how their actions have impacts. But if we explain it to them, you know, if we emphasize, you know, with everyone saying, hey, this is what's happening. This is what we need. Um, this is our planet. Then people start to care, people st start to love, and that's when people act. So science communication, I think, is one of the most important things in science. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> All right, so it's uh, getting about that time where we're going to wrap. Uh, so we have two <laughs> final questions for you that Sarah uh, always likes to ask. Uh, and those two questions are, you have everyone's attention in the entire world. It seems like everyone in the world at least is on this Zoom, which is great. Um, awesome. And you can tell them one thing about literally anything. Oh, I'm sorry, no, qu first one. Uh, you can tell them one thing about ocean microplastics. What is it? And two, you can tell everyone in the world one thing about literally anything. It can be as big and important or as silly and small as you like, whatever that would be. So first, ocean microplastics, and then you have the stage, anything you're in the world you want to talk about. Okay. Um, all right, so ocean plastics. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the most important thing about ocean plastics. Final <laughs> message, final message. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Please reduce your use in plastics. If you don't, they get into the ocean and they cause big problems for all our marine fauna and it eventually comes back to us. So we love our communities. We love our planet. Let's all do our part. <laughs> and and the second just anything. One, <laughs> just anything. Um, just to narrow it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, to all, to all the science lovers out there, you know, scientists or just anyone who loves science, you don't have to be a scientist. Follow your heart. Um, Follow your heart to any career that you want. And um, wow, this is huge. <laughs> this is a huge method. <laughs> but yeah, no, just um, if you love science, pursue it. Um, there are so many different opportunities for everyone. You don't have to be a researcher. You know, you can be a teacher. You can be a programs coordinator. Um, you can even be a dive instructor and teach people how to dive correctly without harming our environment. Everyone is important. In the science, everyone is important. Everyone has a role and everybody does science. So thanks everyone for having me. <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so that's that's all from us. Uh, Sandra, Sandra, is there anything you'd like to plug? Anything you'd like um, those watching to know about that you're doing? Um, I, I, I believe you have an email. If, if I'm so sorry, because there's so many questions. A lot of them are great. I don't have time to get to them all. Maybe they can reach you at an email address. Of course. So anybody can reach me at my email, inspired.sandra at gmail.com. And um, also, guys, check out our Reef Bites. Um, so it's www.reefbites.com. Um, we're always welcoming new writers. 
And yeah, we look forward to put out some material out there that everyone loves. <laughs> Great. Uh, I encourage everyone to go check out those resources. Um, before we go, thank you so much, Sandra, and also to our interpreter, Aaron. Um, if you enjoyed this experience uh, and would like to support our programs and efforts to put on events like this one, you can do so at patreon.com slash Skype a scientist or at paypal.me slash Skype a scientist. With that, please, everyone have a great day. Um, bye. Thanks, everyone.